I'm Anthony Bennett from Reboot the Future. Um, I'm CEO, and this is Molly Fannin from CEO of the Museum of the UN. And shortly, hopefully, we will have Safran Minar, Climate Advocate and Director of Earth Lanka, joining us online. Uh, these are disrupted times, and some of our speakers have experienced disruption only this afternoon. Uh, but I think we just have to, to, to accept that that's part of uh, what the climate emergency means. Um, just to give you a little bit of kind of heads up, Reboot the Future is a small foundation co-founded by Kim Pullman, I think two or three years ago now. And we start with a simple premise of uh, treat others and the planet as you would wish to be treated. So it's our own version of the golden rule. And it, the heart of that idea is that there is a reciprocity, a social reciprocity between us and each other. And also that reciprocity extends to the earth and how we choose to treat uh, Mother Earth. But that reciprocity also extends to intergenerational conversations as well. And not so far from here, there is a, 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 there's been a protest march today led by, by Greta, which is possibly the most visible and salient form of climate communication that is available to us now. It's in terms of the setting the cultural agenda, Greta and the Fridays for the Future movement and the, the schools activists and the, the school strikes have been, I think, part of the determining force for how we've come to understand climate science on a popular level. But I think part of the question here is today is what is the impact of that work on the kind of negotiations that are happening to us or what's happening around us in the blue zone. Reboot the Future has a platform called globaldimension.org UK and in it we engage with about 15,000 school teachers who are all interested in the sustainable development goals. And of course, part of that interest is that the sustainable development goals, the, the 17 goals mandated by the UN as our key drivers for uh, systems change and growth, those SDGs are, have little popular traction. And they, the only, there's only one country in the world just now which actually has those goals mandated uh, within their national curriculum, that's Italy. So again, part of this compact that we have between generations is thinking about what, do we, what, is, what, is our, what is our covenant with the students in our schools? What's the covenant with the young people in our system? And the biggest part, the macro part of that, is the covenant between North and South. In the global North, we have a, a rapidly aging and elderly demographic, which consumes something, anything between 9 and 17 times the world's resources of the poorest South. And of course, in the global South, where the population continues to grow, we have a hugely younger profile. So this intergenerational dialogue is not just one between parents and children, and it's not just one between activists and business. It's also a dialogue between the poorest people in the world and the, the richest people in the world, and the people in those geographically privileged areas uh, which suffer the, the least effects of climate versus those in the most geographically exposed areas as well. Wow. So with that in mind, I think we're just going to uh, take an, an open conversational aspect to this, Molly. You want to start by telling us a little bit about Museum of the UN and uh, how you've started with it and what your, kind of, your core premise of your work is. Sure. Um, so when the United Nations and at the time Secretary General Ban Ki-moon launched the Sustainable Development Goals, the idea was developed that if we had any hope of achieving the SDGs, we needed a wholly new type of institution, one that would focus on helping everybody the world over, so the students that all of you teach, um, whether you're here physically or watching online, everybody the world over to realize their own agency and to begin to act on that agency. So the word museum is um, important when you think of it as a disruptor in the disruptive sense, but we're a museum for, not about, the United Nations. We carry the brand of the United Nations, but we set, sit separately, totally apart so that we can be provocative, so that we can move fast, so that we can take risks, because right now that's what the world needs, it needs institutions that are ready to try new things very quickly, see what works, be willing to fall flat on our faces and fail, like we're actually not doing, because Saffron's here now. Um, hey, one Saffron. more joined. Um, and and to, to help push the agency and the resilience and the brilliance of people everywhere, irrespective of age and irrespective of geographic location, to really democratize the agenda and to realize that it is incumbent on every single one of us 
to, to take action, and it's especially incumbent on every single one of us that have the privilege to be in rooms like this, mm -hmm. to look outside and say, who's not here? Yeah. And yeah, so I joined about two years ago. So that's interesting you say that the UN gives you a special uh, license or a long leash. Very long leash. Because they accept that their current operating model is insufficient to the task? <laughs> I don't want to get fired. They won't be watching today. us, all right. You can, right yeah. you, it's, just, no, I think, it's just you and me here. I think um, it's just you and me and everyone watching online. I don't think the UN thinks that their current operating model is insufficient to the task, but I think they realize, I hope, I hope the United Nations realizes that they are one actor of many. And that the three founding words of the United Nations when the UN was founded 76 years ago were we the peoples. Mm -hmm. And people have forgotten that that's what it is. It's we the people. You and I are the United Nations. And Saffron, hi, Saffron. It's the United Nations, too. And, and so they're not sufficient. Mm. No one organization is sufficient. We have to recreate a whole new sen a sense of a global we if we have any chance of dealing with climate, or I would posit any major global issue. Mm. Um, and so I hope that they know that they're insufficient. And I hope I don't get fired for saying that. I don't Fair think enough. so. Yeah. Safran, hello, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Wow, that's so clear. Um, a couple of questions to you. I wonder, it said in the briefing notes for our discussion that um, we should assume that everyone's read your, your uh, bio, but I wonder maybe you could just say a little bit about the work you do with Earth Lanka. And then perhaps my question to you would be, you're somebody who has a number of different profiles um, and positions and platforms where you have a, a voice which is an official youth representative voice. Right? So I, I guess my, my, my curiosity is with the work that you do is to whom do you think you're speaking? And the second part of that would be, are they listening and what impact does it have? Uh, thanks, Anthony, and uh, thanks, uh, Molly. And don't worry, Molly, you won't get fired. I think <laughs> it was, uh, I think, uh, two, couple of months ago, the Secretary General acknowledged it when he was visiting Fiji, so. Yeah, you're right, he did. Idea. Thanks yeah. for the reassurance, Saffron. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Anthony, for this opportunity. Uh, myself, uh, Saffron Minhar from uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, the work that I've been doing is uh, with Earth Lanka, we, we empower young people to develop climate solution across Sri Lanka, and also we educate them on sustainable development goals, mainly when it was launched in the year of uh, 2015 since then and then before that it was the NDGs we also did the post 2050 2015 how uh, how did they really go through for the last 15 years and then we were part of the development process of a consultation process across the globe for uh, SDGs so uh, the question we I think I would say the people and young people and today we are more than half of the world population and we can't leave behind them when we have a discussion or when we uh, go into a process of uh, implementation or process of planning and they should be there in all the decision making process and also young people should share the responsibility of, uh, of making sure that uh, leaders and also making sure that your community is being uh, transformed into an uh, environmental and climate friendly uh, society so that we can achieve a better world in the middle of the century. Thank you. And uh, can I ask that the, in terms of today is um, the, the theme of the COP today is youth and the, the, the theme of this program of discussions we've been having today is education. And I think what Greta and other activists have done is make that link um, quite clearly forged between the, the Fridays for the Future movement and this idea of disruption to the education system as being a necessary corollary for the next stage of it. Can I ask, from your perspective in, in your part of the world and the geographies that you're engaged with, what, what, how does the education system um, require disruption in terms of climate change and, and uh, systems change? Well, uh, in my part of the world, firstly, education is free. So anyone can access it from, from kindergarten to the, uh, until you get your degree, you can 
do it free and have a couple of exams that you need to do and if you pass them, you then have the opportunity to, uh, to study for free. And in terms of kind of education, yes, it has been developed with uh, most of the curriculum and sustainable yes, uh, education in uh, probably in the year of five and six and seven. Not if you want to extend where, you know, it's more uh, to a slight extent where people get, the students are taught and they're aware of something happening, warming, you know, all of those uh, aspects of it. But not particularly the SDGs or, you know, the area of sustainable development goals, that has not been really embedded to any system. But overarching area of how sustainable development has been, uh, you know, embedded into the curriculum of many parts of the uh, most of the uh, school uh, in, in Sri Lanka, as I'm for sure speaking of, and also in other countries in South Asia. But uh, in terms of, I, I believe is that, you know, when you want to develop a country, you need to invest in human development. Investing in human development means that you invest on education. Educating people is the most fundamental thing. You know, how people are knowledgeable and there's two ways, you know, if you take literacy rate of Sri Lanka is 94 percent and people don't write and read and so those are how, how do you set your, um, uh, what do you call, um, um, how do you set your goals or how do you set, how do you, you know, see that who is, what, what is education, what, what do you, what defining education is, is something that, you know, uh, we have to think about. If you look at most of the countries, you know, it's people are literally know to read and write. It doesn't mean they're educated on certain aspects of the uh, process and which is needed. Okay, thank you. I just, so we're enjoying our two latest guests. Thank you so much. Welcome to Glasgow. Thank you. Or Glasgow, as I'm learning to call it. <laughs> um, Ziomino and Jeremy, thanks so much for joining us. A pleasure. Thank you. Um, I, I said at the start that it's assumed that everyone's read your, your, your profiles online, but uh, just to uh, reiterate, Jeremy is one of our foremost kind of uh, advisors and thinkers on systems change within climate. And uh, Ziamina is a climate activist from Colombia and founder of Bar Barranquilla. Barranquilla. Plus Thank you for that. <laughs> um, Jeremy, I'm just I'm going to alternate between our, our activists and, and kind of uh, organizers. Jeremy, can I ask you? The central premise is that we have essentially two tracks of activity, right? We have, we have uh, Greta's and um, the climate activist movement on the streets who seem to be capturing the dominant part of the discourse, right? Who seem to be, in a sense, having the, the big popular dialogue seems to rest with them. And then we have the negotiators and the people who are pulling the levers of power within the blue zone. And as somebody who perhaps has of all the people in the panel has had most insight to what happens within those closed rooms, within, uh, within climate negotiations and, and within big business. What, what, is the, what is the impact for those decision makers of those kind of protests? Are they indifferent to them? Are they accelerate? Do they choose to accelerate their work because of those protests? How do those protests percolate into change? Uh, well, look, I, I mean, the good news, right, is that they do percolate. Um, and I, I think we would not be where we are today had we not had, you know, the activists on the street. And, and you, know, you, you talk about, you know, me being some expert in system change. Um, and we should all be a bit humble here. I mean, the way systems change is that the next generation comes through and has their voice heard. Yeah. That is the only way only deep and lasting way in which systems change. It's a generational phenomenon because however much I may like to think I understand it, I can tell you that the perspective that you know, the 25-year-olds and then the 15-year-olds have and the way that they hold the world because they, they grew up with a different, if you will, frame of reference mm. is just different to the one, however enlightened I may hope to be, that I can ever have. So the only way that system change, it's not a kind of, it's a nice to have, isn't it great that we've got you know, younger people on the streets. The only way that system change of this nature and this magnitude happens is when we listen to those voices and when those voices are the ones that actually shape the dialogue. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't in some ways try and 
create a kind of a horse race between the outside game and the inside game. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. they, are well, they are absolutely essential, if you will, to sides of, of a green coin. Um, and, and so they are heard. Um, there's, a, there's often a frustration, I can tell you, not amongst everybody on the quote unquote inside game. And I don't want, these are caricatures, right? There's many, many people, and I hope I'm one of them, that looks to build bridges between these multiple points of connection. Um, but, I, but I can tell you that there are many on the quote unquote inside game that are really frustrated that they can't move faster or they don't know how. It's not that they just often don't know how because they are locked in and don't have the degrees of, if you will, almost psychological freedom yeah. that, that you need to have. So, um, you know, I, I think those on the, if you will, the younger activists never ever underestimate how much impact you're having. And, 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 and if there's one thing that would be helpful, let's get more of you inside the blue zone. <laughs> Uh, there's no point in me trying to be this sort of translator, and I do a bit of that. I'd much rather just bring that group of people who are, if you say, as you put it, on the streets into the blue zone, right, so that, that not only their voice is heard, but that there's a real conversation. Mm -hmm. Because it's only through that conversation that we're going to learn how to explore a very different future that frankly, none of us, neither the younger people nor the older people, none of us actually know, but we can learn from each other as to how we might explore possible futures together. Thank you. Zio, do you want to pick up on that? I mean, I, it, may, it may be useful just to say a little bit about the work that you do in Colombia and particularly that youth-centered uh, work that you lead on. Well, I think that many of these points are absolutely <laughs> the right track that the climate movement, the youth movement has been like advocating many years ago. Indeed, I think that the climate movement has a lot of years. Like now it's more popular, but we started like, personally I started like this climate activism since nine years ago. So I was inspired by the Rio Plus 20 process and I feel like we have gained a lot indeed. I think that many years ago, we didn't have like local policies. We didn't have a, a lot of projects, you know, that were like advocating for climate action, not only as a mitigation issue, but also as an adaptation issue. Mm. Uh, and there is like, you know, a big difference that uh, the climate crisis has been caused by these greenhouse, greenhouse gases emissions, but also like we are already seeing the losses and damages. <laughs> and I feel like in this, COP, for example, uh, there's still this definition of what is exactly climate loss and why we need to compensate for that. You know, like the people that have been affected and are already being affected by th this proportionally, uh, the climate crisis. And for example, I, and I say this because, you know, I think that this COP is also becoming an issue of uh, promises, pledges, but we are still missing the implementation roadmap. And that's what I, you know, I would love to see in this COP. So I hope that next week <laughs> we can see, you know, like clear measures on how we are going to get this money, who is going to put, you know, like contribute in which, uh, like, uh, size of the portion of the pledges, the climate pledges for finance, for emissions, and not only like just discourses that we feel somehow that has been like just discourses, um, empty <coughs> words that are not like reaching uh, what we need. So we need to put women at the center, young people at the center, children at the center. We need to put life again, not only market. So I think that also this COP has been a lot of finance, which is of course necessary because it's an enabling tool for climate action. But it's not only like to reach the money or to get the money, but to bring life again to the conversation and think that we need human rights again. We need to also uh, warranty human rights. Climate action cannot become an issue that, uh, you know, like can promote uh, not human rights, because we have seen in Colombia, like many projects that are from carbon markets, for example, are not that effective in securing indigenous and local communities' rights. So I think that these topics are important because climate change and this climate crisis is the opportunity to shift. 
to really shift the way that we are developing, living, and also relating with nature. And uh, yeah, I think that also we lose like this uh, vision of seeing the human beings that we are as just one species more in, in, the, in the planet and not just like, you know, uh, shifting and damaging everything. And this is like, yeah, one of my messages maybe. So we are already seeing the losses, the damages, and I don't know why the convention is not like involving this effectively. Also the women, the youth, the children, voices, voices are being sidelined from this conversation. We have gained a lot, but it's still, you know, a lot of that we are missing to be effectively involved in this, to be, uh, you know, to be implementing this intergenerational equity principle that we, like, you know, push it a lot to gain it in the party agreement text. And finally, like, <laughs> we got it after many years, like, working. And yeah, I think that this is central if we want to see not only like 30 years of more dialogues on summits, but action. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I hear you nodding. Do you want to respond to that? Well, so much of what all of you have said really rings true. Um, our mission statement is to drive billions of people to take action. It's not to educate. It's not to inspire. It's not to sow seeds for something that might happen someday. Because I agree with you, Jeremy, that we need that young people are coming in and they will drive it like any major shift. What I would say though is that we need people like Zio and Saffron and we need them in hordes right now. And we, we don't have the time. Like the window is still there in which to solve this crisis, but it's, it's, closely, it's quickly closing, right? And so what we've been thinking about at, at my organization is how do we get the many people who aren't yet Zeos and Saffrons who aren't yet dedicating their entire lives and who aren't yet marching on the streets. I just came through this, the, the march on my way here to stand up and realize like I have a role to play. It's not just on me, but if I don't, if I don't demand change from those at the top that have the ability to access the finance and from what, then we won't move fast enough. That it, it, it's not up to individual actions of billions of people. That's not enough to solve the problem but it is enough to perhaps drive the systems change that we need. And so we've been thinking about, so how do, how do you get a lot of people to take action and swiftly? And um, what I think what we're learning is in speaking with a lot of, I had this major aha moment a few years ago where I met with one of the world leading experts on mindset shifts, because that's really what we're talking about is, can we be optimistic and hopeful and roll up our sleeves and get this done, right? That's a mindset shift from being apathetic and the vast majority of people are either just not engaged or, ap or apathetic. So what we're really looking for is mindset shift and what behavioral science now is indicating is that in the trends of society where mindset is shifting, which are not a lot of places, hmm. that it's actually how to hack popular culture and mass culture in new ways to radically democratize access to education and inspiration that can then lead to behavior change because it changes social norms. Um, so we're working kind of at scale now with mass culture and behavior change science and domain science, not in, intentionally not in the global north, but starting out in my, my whole career has been in 40 countries predominantly in the global south where a lot of ingenuity already lies mm. and saying we need, to, we need to hack culture where people already are and not expect them to come to us not expect them to come to the classroom, not expect them to come, in my case, to a museum, not expect them to come or even care about the cop or this lapel pin that you wear, right? <coughs> because the vast it. majority of the world does not live in a color-coded circle. Um, but to go to where people already are and meet them there and inspire them with a sense that they, in their own capacity, wherever they are, can be agents of change because that's, that's what we need, whether you're in Colombia or Sri Lanka or other places. So Molly, I know you've got a short film from the UN that we can show now, just a, a couple of minutes long. So can we roll to that? Just yeah, so? we can roll to that. So the, the quick on this is, this is a trailer for something that's coming soon. Um, and we, this is the first time we're premiering it, but it's actually the second time. So we premiered it with a thousand Indian students last week in tier two and tier three cities across all of India. Um, and one person said, you know, what this made me realize was that 
it doesn't matter what hospital you're born in or what school you can go to, you can afford to go to. I can take action, I can make a difference no matter who I am. Bizarre sightings have been reported all over the country of ordinary people turning into... We don't know what they are yet, but we do know that they are calling themselves Defenders of Planet Earth, or DOE for short. Experts are even calling this the next phase in human evolution. And if this is true, we don't know what that means for the future. This is just in Ripu Daman from New Delhi, who used to be an ordinary jogger, now identifies himself and his tribe as the Safai Walas or the cleaners. Divya Ravichandran from Goa is leading by example on how to make every home and business in India sustainable and zero waste. Pridhima Pandey's angry letters are terrifying world leaders into action. Seemart Gaukar, one of the first to evolve into a dope hero, was last seen walking through mangroves just outside of Mumbai, helping restore them back to its former glory. These are very strange developments. Another report has just come in. Kunal Negandhi was last seen walking through a bamboo forest. He's said to be looking for inspiration from nature on how to build climate-positive bamboo structures. Shinmaya Khanikar has been conserving dugongs and sea grasses in the Gulf of Mannar, halfway to Sri Lanka. It seems what we're seeing is the first wave of people taking the future into their own hands. What will happen if we all do so? What will happen if we all do so? What is happening is good. We are shaping the future. Deciding to do something. To act. I am a defender of planet Earth. We are the change we want to see. We are a new generation of ordinary superheroes the world needs. We are the next phase in human evolution. I'm a defender. I am a defender. 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 I am a defender of planet Earth. Coming soon, only on every screen imaginable. I think, you, I think the, the one thing I would say, if you'll allow me, is that this is one experiment of many that we have going in the world about how, so in India, the economists this week alone said, you know, if, if Asia doesn't move, we're toast, right? But the average Indian citizen might not yet have time to identify with the issues of climate. So in the same article, in the same edition of The Economist this week, it talks about Bollywood as the secular religion of India. So how do you hack into Bollywood? to access the 375 million Generation Z young people that are there to help them understand how they can take actions. This will be a quiz show. This is education. It's education using mass culture. In Colombia, we're working with Atercio Palados and with a lot of rock stars mm -hmm. across Latin America to integrate sounds of biodiversity with, with popular music, right? And we're doing the same now in Nigeria on the intersection of health and climate using Nollywood as an example. So it's like, Right now, the, the issue is so immense that we have to be willing to throw everything at it and take real risks. 
And what behavior change scientists are saying is that not only might mass culture be untapped at global scale, but it might be unparalleled in its potential to really make a difference. I think it's interesting that you, we could say that uh, culture is significantly under leveraged. Yeah, in terms people of think it's science. fluff, it's like decoration. Yeah. Um, in a similar sense, you might say that actually the, the youth empowerment is similarly under leveraged. Absolutely. Can I bring it back to Zia because we mentioned Colombia there, and, uh, but I, we started off by talking about the, the climate strikes and futures, uh, futures of the Friday, or Fridays mm -hmm. to the future rather. Um, can I ask you about your experience of the education system, either personally or working with educators, and how that makes manifest some of these work? Sure. Like first, like really like it, this video. <laughs> I like it, the fact that evolution is linked to defending the earth. Mm. Because even that sounds, you know, like maybe, uh, yeah, important and you can all agree, there's a lot of people dying because they're doing this in Colombia. Absolutely. Mm. So it's like, uh, just, you know, like just to name it because it's, it's very difficult to do all kind, you know, all this kind of activism in Colombia, especially in rural communities. But yeah, that's another story. <laughs> but I didn't want, you know, like to miss the time to say it because yeah, I, I got like, you know, this reminder from the video. <laughs> uh, yeah, in Colombia we are working in Barranquilla Plus 20 in education, mostly informal education. We found, you know, this is important uh, to engage uh, people in the conversation, in the climate conversation, not only from the science or the policy, but also interculture and related uh, to their own territories. So the first aspect that we identified that is key for climate education is that this really needs to be linked to your own ecosystems, your own realities. Like you don't want to learn from others, uh, you know, ecosystems, experiences, but you want to just relate in your territory. Uh, also, we have seen that uh, there is a lot of uh, ancestral knowledge that has been like passing through generations. So that way we also got uh, inspired by this principle of intergenerational equity because this is the only way that we are going to secure sustainability and climate action in the long term. We are demanding climate action now, of course, but this cultural shift needs to come you know, in the long term. So I think that uh, intergenerational equity and this exchange of learned between uh, grandmas, grandpas, children, young people, women, you know, it's very enriching, has been make us like, they can engage in this climate conversation, downscaling it from this COP or big this, this, this discussions, IPCC like stuff, because people already in the territories, they got the climate memory. Yeah, we yeah. call it like this because if we want to learn from, you know, how was the climate in the past, we need to contact people. We don't have the data in all territories and, and yeah, like then these uh, intergenerational exchanges become enriching for climate education. Um, also, we are seeing that in the formal education system, there is a clear need to integrate climate in curricula. There's very few examples of this in Colombia. Unfortunately, it has been coming increasingly important, but it's not like common. So what we want to achieve is that. So we are studying, uh, like, uh, studying or like reading the planets that they have in the schools, and we are finding the way to create a methodology that can help schools in order to you know, like integrate climate effectively in their curricula. Not as a, another activity or just a celebration or one day stuff, you know, because this is more also common that uh, we are working in climate, they say, but they only have one day for the whole year, so this is not what we want. What we want is climate action to be effectively mainstream in all subjects and in the curricula. So yeah, we are working on this. We hopefully, hopefully like gonna get this very soon so we can you know, like engage more schools into the low carbons and resilient schools. This is how we call our initiative in Barranquilla Plus 20. And yeah, I will keep you all <laughs> updated on this. Thank you very much. So I'm just conscious of time. I'm gonna ask Safran the same question. Safran, if you're still there. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, your, your, perhaps your, pers your personal experience of the education system, but also how the impact of educators in schools is in the work uh, you do. Uh, yeah. So, 
what we have uh, done, like uh, as uh, Sylvie said, is that we also try to go to informal education. Informal education is something that is really more impactful when we uh, try to educate, uh, especially uh, young people and also especially people uh, who are in older generation to also make them aware of, of certain uh, climate impacts that they have been going through and what they can do. But in terms of uh, the formal process, uh, Anthony, that, you know, the Article 12 of the Paris Agreement talks about public participation, the AIDS Action for Climate Empowerment. So parties have to, to reiterate what Xiaomi said is that we need the text. The text is already there in the uh, Paris Agreement and the rules that they have to get involved all people and they have to embed in a climate education so the part of the negotiation is almost done and it's a responsibility for everyone to to uphold it and and, and in, in the process wise because i always see is that young people have two sides of the process you know one one side of young people are into activism but also young people's responsibility is that be on the table make the change push for agendas in local government and where they could really uh, bring uh, the change that needs to be uh, changed. Because if not, we'll be talking for another 30 years, for sure. I guarantee it. We, we did it 20 years ago, 30 years ago when we launched the, the, the UN uh, climate, change, climate Change and also the um, Agenda um, uh, 21, which was launched in 1992, but still we've been talking since then. And but the temperature has been rising for nearly 414 as per uh, this year. So I, I believe is that young people should take the ownership and also develop solutions. You know, if not, we will also be somebody just, you know, being on the street, just talking, you know. Of course, everybody knows about climate change. Most of the people right now are aware that they need to do something. And what we need to do is that government alone cannot achieve the whole process. We, as young people, to bring in agendas, push in local communities, especially on the education field, to empower a lot of people to, to know about how uh, the um, how we, they can tackle climate change in their household, single steps like the video that we saw. That's amazing. We need we need to empower so many of those people. COP, conference, yes, people know about it and everything, most of the things are on policy and and you know agenda that's been implemented and passed in and it has been you know globally acknowledged and we just need to push that and that is what is really lacking from the side of um, most of the people right now and COVID-19 has taught us that we can make a change you know if uh, lastly that you know if humanity, humanity can develop a vaccine in the span of 12 months for COVID I'm pretty optimistic that we can you know, reduce the carbon emission and limit for 1.5. And then it is possible. And it's through education is one of the elements that we need to really focus on. Thank, thank you, Safan. I'm conscious of time. Uh, I'm going to ask one last question of Jeremy and then perhaps uh, close up with Molly. But I just wanted to ask Jeremy, we started off talking about the relationship between systems change and young, youth activism. But I'm also interested in this idea of systems change in education. And from your kind of helicopter level on this is, how does you, the work you do is in, in large scale systems change for food and these, these big kind of industrial and commercial systems? Where do you see systems change within education aligning with that? Um, so I'll give you the short answer. Probably, um, to probably what is, and I think you might appreciate that to what is a, an enormous question. It is the system at the end that needs to change the most in many respects. But there are two pieces of it that I think are particularly significant in the, in the moment that we're in right now. Um, one is that if you look at the way in which education works in most places in the world, I'm sure there are exceptions, but it generates this, if you will, sort of um, siloed point of view. We take each subject and we have a specialization in maths and we have specialization in English and, and you go your way as a scientist or you're, you go your way on the arts side. And, and so what we do from a very early age, remarkably early age, is to sort of force the disciplines apart and to force people into, if you will, a reductionist view of the world. And I heard you describe a different, if you will, form of wisdom which is much more interdisciplinary and much more holistic 
And, and so one of the things that needs to change in a profound and very deep way in education systems everywhere is how to actually build that interdisciplinary skill set. Because I promise you, the moment that you get locked into a narrow specialization, then the chances of coming up with the solutions that we've been talking about here goes way down. Mm. So piece one is, is interdisciplinary approaches. And of course, climate is the ultimate interdisciplinary topic. It doesn't need to be layered onto existing classes or whatever, but it needs to be a cross-cut that enables people to learn and explore in a different way. So that's observation one. And number two is simply that, at least in this country, and I don't want to speak for any other country, but the education system, while it has many, many strengths, is an amplifier of structural inequality. Yeah. Right? And we will not solve climate in a deeply unequal society. Right? It, we have got to bring the climate justice story and the social justice story together. And if our education system perpetuates and deepens structural inequalities in society and leaves many, many people feeling left out from the get-go or that they're on the slow track and that they therefore have no real voice and no real agency, I promise you that we won't solve this problem. Or if we do, we solve it in a way that creates new and worse divides. So the, when I know we all like to go, solving for the finance system is the biggest and diffi most difficult thing. There are many difficult things, but one of them is to get to the heart of an, creating education systems that do genuinely open up for those that are at the, you know, who, who need the, if you will, the most support, rather than, as they do certainly here, amplifying differences, because it's that society which we all want to build. That's what we're working towards. Yeah. Thank you. So um, that very eloquent summation uh, sort of uh, does my job as a sort of synthesis. I, like, I don't think I could add to that particularly. We are just about to come to time. Um, rather than a synthesis, I wonder, I'm just about to, because this is a, a pedagogic discussion, we're about to set some homework at the end, and Molly's going to introduce a task for the, for the weekend. Um, but I just wondered if perhaps you could thank our panel just now, Jerry, Molly, Zio, and Safran for their contributions today. Yeah. And Molly, if you could tell us about this so evening's the, I task. Think, I think the task, if someone could throw up the screen that I don't have the power to throw up, um, is to realize that actually I have three kids. They're seven, four, and ten and that actually we don't have to wait for the power that they have. And we're focused on bringing the unheard voices to COP, right? It's been scientifically proven now that children as young as 10 years old can be the single largest influencer in swaying their parents' opinion on climate in the United States, girls in particular, um, because of their ability to, to communicate ways in, in, a trust, in a trusted way. When you educate children, on climate, you don't have to wait 30 years for them to take up official positions. They become change makers overnight. So tonight on the armadillo, you're getting a sneak peek. We are projecting in the midst of other unheard voices that should be here and more present at COP, the voices of young children who are demanding change. And that we as an organization are going to make sure that the adults and those in positions of power listen. Because there's wisdom to be found, whether in indigenous communities or in the mouths of eight-year-olds. And just to be clear, the Armadillo, for those not aware, is the name of the official Blue Zone destination. So if you make your way to the River Clyde at... Yeah, between 7 and 10 p.m. tonight, it will be, um, we'll take over the entire Armadillo or croissant, whatever you think it looks like. <laughs> don't, don't say it's a croissant, it will be too busy. Um, and we have an image of it? Or? Yeah, I think it, I think it rolled. Uh, and that's you. Hello. Thank You'll you. see it tonight. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, everyone.